If you're like Butler, then you're a major nerd for everything Star Trek. Look, I like Star Trek, but I couldn't tell you the difference between a Betazoid and a Kelpian. Well, you should know what a Kelpian is, Field, since it's a race of aliens who inhabit the planet Kaminar, and it also happens to be the race of Commander Saru of the Starship Discovery. See? Major nerd. It's no secret that I love Star Trek, which means I can't get enough of Star Trek Discovery on CBS All Access. And now you can get the chance to see Star Trek perfectly free as CBS All Access has made all six episodes of Star Trek Short Treks available to stream for a limited time. Star Trek Short Treks are standalone short stories that allow fans to dive deeper into the key themes and characters that fit into Star Trek Discovery and the expanding Star Trek universe. And honestly, they're pretty good. And our word is good enough, right? No. Well, how about Star Trek Short Treks has been nominated for an Emmy for Outstanding Short Form Comedy or Drama Series? Oh, now you're interested? So why not head over to CBS All Access to start your free trial today and check out Star Trek Short Treks, but make sure you go through the link on our podcast page, Forgotten Cinema, at ForgottenEntertainment.com. Otherwise, what's the point of this ad? Am I right? Support us. Live long and prosper. I told you we weren't doing that. Ladies and gentlemen, please notice that exits are conveniently located at the front and rear of this auditorium. When leaving the theater, we suggest that the exit at the front of the auditorium will allow you easier access to the parking areas. Thank you. Oh, stop your slow clap. <laughs> why, are you, why are you from Texas now? Because uh, I got to choose my stock. <laughs> How's that for high energy? That's false advertising. <laughs> no. Oh, come on. <laughs> Does every actor that portrays the cop in the movie have to wear a fedora? You heard it here, folks. <laughs> Mike Field is dead inside. <laughs> I'm actually trying to figure out who Brooklyn Decker's married to. Nice. What? She doesn't like, say it like she that. She does say it like she that. She doesn't say it's it like stupid. that. stupid. Cowards. Cowards is what they're called, Mike. They're called cowards. Hello, I'm Mike Butler. And I'm Mike Field. And you're listening to the Forgotten Cinema Podcast. Each episode, we highlight a film that, for a variety of reasons, was forgotten by audiences. Whether it be because a more popular movie was released at the same time, or the film simply didn't catch on with an audience in its initial run. We'll discuss what we love about the movie, or perhaps don't love about it, but we'll always recommend you revisit it. If you enjoy our podcast, please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this podcast. What's up? Nothing, you know, just screwing over some yuppie so I can get my drug money. <laughs> <laughs> Selling that pharmaceutical cocaine, yo. That's right. <laughs> we are traveling back to the 90s uh, where we are, we are going to be talking about The Last Seduction. Real quickly, I'll let you know what that's about. And then we'll get into who's in it, who did it, who talked about it, who wrote it, and what Mike and I thought of it. Break it down, Mike. Looking to escape her unhappy marriage, villainous femme fatale Bridget Gregory, played by Linda Fiorentino, convinces her husband Clay, played by Bill Pullman, to sell cocaine, pharmaceutical cocaine, that is, then steals the profits and run out, runs out on him. She stops in a small town en route to Chicago, where she ensnares her conquest insurance man Mike Swaley. I can't remember if that's how he says his name. Played by Peter Berg. He definitely pronounces it Mike. He does. <laughs> After getting a job at his insurance company, Bridget convinces Mike to run a scam, but things can take a deadly turn when she recruits him to help get rid of her husband. It's not a bad synopsis. It's a little. Uh, it's not exactly what happens, but it's not bad. It's pretty close to what happens. Yeah. yeah. It, it's it, they're it missing is. that hour where nothing happens, but we'll get into whoa, it. Whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa! So the last seduction came out. On Wednesday, October 26th, 1994, it's a runtime of 110 minutes. It's rated R. Production budget of $2.5 million. It's opening weekend. It did $45,000. We'll get into that as well. Domestic, $5.8 million. Worldwide, five point eight. So obviously, probably did not get a international release. Production company was ITC Entertainment and was distributed by October Films. Now, the thing with The Last Seduction is that it was actually released on HBO before it came out into the theaters. And Fiorentino, this is a movie that kind of catapulted her to bigger roles. Mm -hmm. uh, she won a Best Act Actress uh, Award for the New York Film Critics, the Independent Spirit Award. She won Best Female Lead, and the, she was a Best Actress nominee for the a BAFTA but she could not be nominated for an Academy Award because it was on HBO. And then that was a no, no back then. 
It's still kind of not the, contentious. Not now. this year, but yes. Yes. Um, Things are slowly changing. Right. Uh, they actually, the Academy was sued by ITC in October, but they lost. So, you know, the, the, it, I don't know if I should have looked and see who was nominated that year. She probably would have been the odds on favorite because this is the when you when people talk about Linda Fiorentino, this is the first movie they talk about. That would have been the 1995 Oscars, right? Uh, no, it would have been the movie. Came no, out you're right. I apologize. Yes, it would be 95 Oscars because the movie came out in 94. I'm on it. Are correct. I'm on it. Keep going with your facts. Uh, I'll let right. you know. So like I said, this movie came out on the 26th of October. You had on the 28th, which was obviously the Friday right after you had Stargate. Silent Fall, not the horror movie Silent. That's Silent Hill. Silent Falls with Richard Dreyfuss. I don't think I've seen it. I, I know of it. I don't think I ever saw it as well. Squanto, A Warrior's Tale. I did not see that. I've seen Squanto. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Road to Wellville, which I have seen as well. Ah, pun intended. And an limited release, Frank and Jesse and Drop Squad. Did you? I saw Drop Squad. Drop Squad's very interesting. Which one's Drop Squad? Drop Squad is about it deals with it deals with race relations and it, it deals with Eric LaSalle plays a guy who is who creates a marketing campaign. He creates a marketing campaign that belittles uh, blacks in America and it, to kind of sell products. Okay. So he's uh, he is. When does this movie take place? This takes place back in the 90s. Oh, it takes place in the 90s. Yeah, okay. no, no, no. And uh, he is kidnapped by these people who uh, who attempt to brain, not brainwash him, but deprogram him uh, into being more, you know, pro African American, pro pro black politics, gotcha. all that stuff. It's 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 like uh, it's I don't want to say surrealistic. It's not that. It's it's part satire, um, but it's uh, it's actually it's it's actually pretty pretty interesting. I, I when I watched it, I enjoyed it. Gotcha. But I haven't seen it since then. Okay. Um, the week before you, on the 21st, you had Love Affair. That is the Warren Beatty and that Benning, I believe, when they fell in love. <laughs> the Puppet Masters, <laughs> Radio Land Murders, and in the limited release, Bullets Over Broadway and Vanya on 42nd Street. You also had Clerks on the 19th Ooh. Uh, in a limited release. So for those, uh, all those burgeoning and uh, filmmakers out there that watched Clerks and then said I could do that and started writing movies. Um, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I have your actress in a re- leading role for 1995. Go for it. Your nominees were Susan Sarandon for The Client, Winona Ryder for Little Women, Miranda Richardson for Tom and Viv, Jodie Foster for Nell, and Jessica Lang for Blue Sky. Lang one, right? Lang one for yeah. Blue Sky. Although Jodie Foster is really good in Nell as well. Mm, yeah. But that's kind of like yeah. a gimme. Fiorentina might have won that year if she was if she was in that. She might have won. Yeah, yeah. that would be nominated. Maybe over yeah. Ronona Ryder and Little Woman. Maybe, yeah. I'm so pro- surprised that, that she got a best actress nod, not a supporting since it's an ensemble piece. But it is her. It does focus on her more in that movie. Yeah. All right. So then the uh, week after this movie came out, the November 4th, you had Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. That's when De Niro played Frankenstein. Yes. <laughs> the War, which I actually like. Double Dragon. I'm sure Mike likes that. I liked it when I was <laughs> seven. <laughs> uh, Oleana and Pontiac Moon in a limited release. So not really a lot. It's it's October. It's not like October used to be uh, now where you have you'll have like there's like there's no horror movies here. You know what I mean? That's really surprising. Yeah. Even for then, I think that's well, Frank, surprising. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but that's in October. And that's obviously not. That's, that's, that's geared toward adults, too. It's yeah. also geared towards hopefully, you know, Oscar nods and yeah. stuff like that. So, yeah, so now I think October has become more horror movies. Oh, I, I take it back. The Puppet Masters, that's a horror movie, but it's Blue Moon Entertainment, so it's not really, you know, considered Oh, yeah, it's not fantastic. Like, yeah. Puppet Masters is not putting teenage butts in the seats. Right, 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 right. So this movie is directed by John Dahl. He also directed Red Rock West, which we did uh, season one, the last episode of season one, right? I believe you are correct. Which I think we talked about this movie when we did Red Rock West because Dahl did both of them and they're both film noirs. Mm-hmm. I always compare these two or talk about these two in the same sentence. Usually this is also one. These are also, this is another film that was early on on our list of films. We'd want to do. If yes. We did this podcast. I put this on the list cause you had never seen it. Right. No. Yeah. 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 Uh, Rounders Joyride and Ray Donovan TV show. Uh, Dahl is also directed. He does a lot of TV episodes here and there. He's got a huge mess of credits. For uh for TV, written by Steve Baransic, he has written No Good Deed seventy five and The Last Seduction two, which by I wanted to watch, 
but I did not get the chance and, and because I couldn't find it because, as Butler told me, it has a 0% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. It is apparently the worst. <laughs> well, and it has none of the characters from the original just the bridget character the bridget characters yeah. back played by a different actress and no one else even appears right it, she's in spain right she is in spain yeah, apparently yeah. breaking up a phone sex ring and trying to steal all their money whatever <laughs> cinematography by jeffrey jour uh he's done such movies as dirty dancing and it's pat the movie <laughs> and my big fat greek wedding composer joseph uh Vatarelli. All right. I apologize if I said that wrong. He has done music for The Crossing Guard. That's the Sean Penn directed movie with uh, Jack Nicholson. Kissing a Fool. And he did some work on the TV show John Adams, the miniseries on HBO, which is a very good miniseries. Yes. Edited by Eric L. Beeson. He has worked on A Simple Plan. Good movie for Love of the Game. The Rookie, The Alamo and Don't Breathe more recently. Produced by John Shestack. And he has produced Air Force One. Disturbing Behavior. Waiting, which is basically clerks in this restaurant, and Dan in real life, among other things. He's done a lot of stuff. So I've already talked about Lena Fiorentino. She plays the lead, Bridget Gregory. She, If you don't know who she is, she's in Men in Black, the first one, Jade, Dogma, and she, her first movie was Vision Quest. Bill Pullman plays Glade Gregory, her husband. Uh, you know him as the president in Independence Day. He's also in While You Were Sleeping, Spaceballs, and more recently, The High Note. Peter Berg as Mike Swaley, or just Mike. Uh, Mr. Berg has been in Fire in the Sky, Copland. He was also on the TV show Chicago Hope, but he is also probably more known or better known as a director and producer. He has directed movies as Mile 22, Patriot's Day, Friday Night Lights, and more recently, Spencer Confidential. He has also done Battleship, and he's he does a lot of... Uh, a lot of action. He's a big time like action movie yeah. director now. He's a he's a he's a decent he's a good director. I yeah. shouldn't say he's decent. He's a good director. We have JT Walsh. I always going to bring him up, even though he was in one day of work and he's in one scene. Uh, he played Frank Griffith. He plays Bridget's lawyer. He was in Good Morning Vietnam. He was also in Red Rock West and Breakdown, which I think we should put on the list if it's not already. That's the Kurt Russell uh getting hunted down by the truck, kind of like uh, oh, okay, yep, yeah, yep, that's a good movie. Yeah, uh, Walsh passed away in 1998, so. Gone too soon. He was really good. Bill Nunn plays Harlan. Uh, he passed away uh, three years ago, four years ago. He was in Do the Right Thing regarding Henry and Sister Act. He is the detective in this movie or the private eye that uh, Clay hires. Dean Norris as Shep. If you don't know who Dean Norris is, you have not seen Breaking Bad. He's on. He's also in Starship Troopers, but uh, he's also more known as for Breaking Bad. And then all I have here is uh, Jack Shear as a public defender because he was in Star Trek First Contact. Yeah. Yeah, I did that for you. I did that for you. Okay, so where do you want to start? Just starting right off the list. As you're reading off all these names and the cast and crew, I'm very surprised that you don't see returning people from Red Rock West into here. You don't see a lot of crossover. Okay. Which for a lot of directors that we we do that do smaller films or noir films or, or films of this nature, especially in the early 90s that are semi-independent films, they usually bring their friends or the people they worked with before. So I'm really surprised that J.T. Walsh is it. The, editor, the only one editors, producers, sound guys. Yeah, music. It's all new people. Yeah, I'm surprised. Well, with the exception of, uh, well, you do have, you know, I don't know where Fiorentino's based out of, if she's based out of New York. But, um, but this movie doesn't take place in New York. Well, now, now, that's the one question I had for you, because I didn't look it up, and maybe I should. Beston. That's not a real town, right? Beston. You know, I was when I was looking up facts about this movie, I know that's a question someone asked, and I just didn't care enough to cl <laughs> click the link to find out. Because so uh, like, eh. it's okay. So it's a small town in Buffalo. I thought that because that when they in the movie, they're trying to track her down and she calls Clay, her husband, and the uh, private eyes on the line. And then they only get the area code. He points to the and it's Buffalo's in that area. Right. Code. Yeah. I just didn't understand how you're going up to Beston to go to Chicago, like you're going up. I didn't get that. Going up toward the Great Lakes and then uh, over to I, Chicago, I, I guess? guess. Is that the is that the path you're taking? I just didn't know. I, it's probably a, a less direct path, so something maybe more right. uh, difficult for him to follow. Right, right. So, well, let's talk about, mm, I don't know where to go here. I mean, you want to start with her? I mean, she's the most important part of the movie. She is the movie. She's the only thing worth watching in the movie. Well, okay, how about this? How about <laughs> in the synopsis, it says that looking to escape her unhappy marriage. Now that you don't know that you just know that he hits her. He hits her, but you also kind of start to realize that he only stopped her that one time. 
Yeah. Yeah. She's in the, my one of my notes in this and this this note I wrote towards the very end was that she is so manipulative. She manipulates everything. She's evil. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, she's no, the no. bad guy. Yeah, I, I know. I know. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not trying to. Not right. to yeah, that's what she is. So there is no even when you think that in this movie, she is giving a true feeling or a true emotion revealing a truce something tr truthful about herself mm -hmm. to another character you really can't believe it because it's all an end game to uh, we don't know what whether just to get out and go be on her own because i really don't think that she started out when she left him thinking that okay now i'm gonna get out of here and then i'm gonna try to get him killed like i didn't th you know what i mean i don't right. think that that was her initial plan i think she just wanted to leave okay you know i mean i don't know what you think I think her initial plan maybe wasn't to get him killed. But yeah, it's it's it was always to get the money. It everything, oh, no, of course, nothing she does is with love or anything like that. It, right. It was always to screw him over, to screw everyone over, to right. get money. Right. It was always her end game. Just to just to get that money from the see the sale. Knowing that he's a doctor that had access to the drugs. Right. Because they never say how long ago they got married, how long they had been married, well, do they? Well, so they. Clay's character is somebody I didn't understand because. Um, his his care because he he says he's a doctor and he's got the he gets the pharmaceutical cocaine right but then when he's in his house and Harlan's there some dude shows up to to buy he's writing a script for him he's like mm -hmm. oh that's my job it's my business so what is your business so are you really do you take office hours or are you just somebody who has a script and somebody comes up for something you write write them out and they go get it what I got was that he just became a doctor. Okay. Because he goes, this is just the payout. This is just to get us started before the, you know, the doctor money starts coming in. Okay. So I think he has just become a doctor. Obviously, he's got probably tons of, you know, medical student loans or whatever. That's what right, I was right. getting from at the beginning, but you don't really get a lot of clay. But I always assumed he had just become a doctor. They want to get this startup money. Right. Okay. Doing this one big sale. So she, but then because now he's got owes ten thousand dollars. Right. Right. That's why he's that wasn't his plan to sell scripts, but now to not get his thumbs broken because he owes a ten thousand dollar interest every week to a loan shark. To a loan so he, shark. So he's somebody who gambles. You're saying he borrowed the money to buy the cocaine. I think he borrowed the money to get the. Uh, right. Well, no, because he must have got a script for the cocaine. So yeah, I, know. I, I know that's not really as important throughout because that's not the story that we're being told here it's more about her so right. that's just kind of like setting her the off set up her yeah path. but it, but there are because the other question i have about clay is i don't get the sense first of all it's bill pullman and i can't take bill pullman seriously as a, as a bad guy it, just no seeing all the stuff i've seen him i just can't you he's, know what i mean he's not really a bad guy though but when he first goes and, and makes the deal for the for the cocaine right um and makes that big sale he like he cowers and he whimpers, but you don't like, and, and you get the sense that he's weak, but then he's not weak. And then he's, then he's badass, And, and now he's, you know what I mean? Then he hits her and that, but then she like turns on him and uh, well, he, he's like wishy-washy. I don't ever get the feeling he's not, he's, he's weak. Yeah. Okay. But he's not the weakest, but yeah, when you put a gun in his face, he's not that kind of criminal. He's not a hard action criminal. Sure. And you know, again, when, when he slaps her, it's like, she pushes him to that. Mm -hmm. And who knows how many other times he's called her weak and stuff like that, because we see that at the end with Mike. Yeah. So we don't know the, the kind of guy Clay is. We just know the kind of guy that Bridget has made him okay. in, in a sense. But he is a little clever. He's a little obviously vindictive, but he kind of enjoys because I think he knows Bridget better than obviously Mike does. Right. So he enjoys in a little bit of way her scheming until he realizes that her scheming really is to you know, get her killed. But I feel like he is in some ways in a different kind of movie in some points. OK, well, here's the other he's in a dark okay. comedy and the other characters are in a a noir. Yeah, because I, I have a note in the midway through it was, or not even midway through is about 33 minutes into the movie because I paused it to get a snack. What? That's right. You don't do that. I needed sour Skittles. So when I paused it, I, I wrote this note. It was, it's 33 minutes into the movie, and I don't know if this movie's a noir, a dark comedy, or a romance. And it, I, I wrote, it's got to choose a path soon because it's been 33 minutes and I don't know where to go. And I was like, it's pretty sure it's too late to go to a comedy. But then not long after that, you get more scenes with Clay, and it's just, oh, he's in a comedy. He is absolutely <laughs> in a comedy. The other characters are not. 
but the other characters are definitely not a romance because she's evil. <laughs> well, where do you, other than Clay, where else were you seeing their comedy elements? How about that in the first 30? In the relationship between Bridget and Mike in their constant hookups and his need to, to talk to her. Yeah. I, I saw it there in, in the way, some of the ways that Mike talked was very, very indie dark comedy kind of a romance thing too. So like I, I kept seeing like little bursts of other types of movies and, and you didn't get to the, the main kind of noir plot. She was always kind of a femme fatale in some way. Right. But you never really got to that. Finally, like the fatale part of the femme fatale until right. probably the last, you know, 30 minutes of the movie. Well, with regard to Mike, you first, when you first see him, you find out that he's gone back from Buffalo. He was married, but he was trying to hide that. Uh, but the, the, you know, badly apparently mm -hmm. so he and and you know he just wanted he didn't want to talk about it i can't get this ring off he, and then he takes it off no he he had um it wasn't a ring it was the copper it was like the the green his, it was greenish it was for the copper oh and that's off. what he's that's trying to rub what, off that's okay. what shep was telling Never, him like okay. oh use this and i don't know what he said to use but i thought he had it stuck in his finger and the thing no. was supposed to try to get it off no, okay. no, no no he was just wiping it off but he talks about when that girl comes by stacy or something like that and he's like, these girls are anchors here. Like, that's what he says. These women are anchors. That's what mm -hmm. he says. So when he says that, my impression of Mike was different to when whatever all the stuff. He oh, absolutely. became yeah. weak once he was with her. You know what I mean? But and he brings it up later because he says to her, you know, being with you, you know, I would want to. And he's like, I was going to leave this town until you oh, showed so, up. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And he's like, you know, being with you means that I'm I know that I'm better than everyone else than here, everyone yeah. else here but you make me feel like you're better that you think you're you better than constantly me. remind me yeah. that you're better than me yeah which like i like that that's a good line yeah but i that his first his very first line when he's talking about these women are anchors doesn't go to that you know what i mean it's no he becomes a much different character from that first scene he becomes right. a moron he becomes a doofus <laughs> just a, a total <laughs> dork um yeah so that so just i wanted to bring that up with with regards to mike um, I, I, I understand what you're saying about the dark comedy. And I know that on my notes here that doll initially thought this movie was a dark right. comedy before, I guess, turning into film noir. Now, I don't know. I don't think that's how he shot it. Maybe some of the script from the original came in, like came in from that. Yeah, there are a couple. I mean, there are a couple of drafts of this film because I also read that the original draft. Mike was the main character. Yeah, it was told from his point of view. Yeah. So that also could be a holdover that beginning scene of Mike being stronger so that we are more relating to him on screen. Right. And then just changing him into this doofus <laughs> that we see this complete Dorcas at the end of the movie. Dorcas. Um, so what's interesting is that she's married to Clay and mm -hmm. she's a femme fatale, but she's married to Clay. So uh, number one, I want to know how long number two, like, is this the beginning of her becoming a femme fatale? Like, has she, you know what I mean? Like, has she just decided I'm done? I'm out. Like, or has she always been a, a this femme fatale, this, this villainous person, this bad person? And suddenly, why did she decide to hitch her wagon to Clay? You know what I mean? Because are you writing the first seduction? Another? Uh, no, HBO I could be. I'm just show. because I'm curious as somebody who clearly doesn't feel like they need anybody. They don't want to deal with anybody's nonsense anymore. They want to be. They want to do whatever they want to do and be rich and powerful. Right. Well, and I think stuff. that's why she married Clay to begin with. He was going to be a doctor, which obviously is money. I think she was already taking steps toward becoming okay. this femme fatale. And this is the, the very first like big score. But I think True. she's always been this kind of sociopathic person. Mm -hmm. And you kind of see that in her job uh, managing the telemarketers. You know, oh, we're yelling, money, at Bernie. yelling at Bernie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so... Yeah, I think she's always been that way, but this is her first big score. But a lot of femme fatales are married to what you perceive as the villain as well, the main villain. True. So he's the money guy. He's that the big fat cat, I guess, in, in a way that Mike has to deal with at the end. He's the main boss, I guess. And then, unlike in most femme fatales, she gets away with it. Most noir stories have the femme fatale changing her ways. Yeah, or they have like a happy ending. Tech, dying uh, or, yeah, being told off and then basically getting caught or getting caught with the, the main bad guy. And a lot of times with femme fatales, a lot of times aren't the lead in movies. Like a lot of times they're like, Oh yeah. They're, they're usually not the lead. Yeah. To, to somebody like Mike would be more of a, of a secondary lead, like the male lead in this, like, you know what I mean? Right. He'd and, be the lead and she'd be second or third. Right. So another female. And I, and 
to this movie's credit, I mean, I'm, I like that. And I, even though I, even though she's a bad person and you're not supposed to root, you shouldn't root for her, but she gets away with it and she's, and it, it's never apologetic. It doesn't do what you say. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's the, that's one. I, I, I'm not a huge fan of this film. Really? I'm, Interesting. I'm not, but that is one of the things I do like because you're, you're waiting for it to tie up nice. You're waiting for Mike to, to get out of it and, right. and for Bridget not to have a plan for something. And she always does, even at the very end when he goes, oh, there is one piece of evidence. And the very last scene is her burning that very last piece of evidence, but, uh, which but is a nothing that, piece of evidence. Right, which it's even such then a stretch. Doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, it, it's he was <laughs> so stupid when he falls for that nonsense. But anyways, all right. So, you know what, since because uh, I clearly like this movie more than you did. So why don't you tell me something that let's let's do it that way. Why don't you tell me something that really you didn't like a lot, like made you not like this movie, I guess, as you're watching it. I paused it at 33 minutes, Mike, and we didn't <laughs> to get, get to the Sour Skittles. We didn't get to the Hey Sour Skittles. You're not a sponsor, but you could be. <laughs> <laughs> you like hey, you like hearing your name right now? <laughs> uh in a in a almost quote unquote Skinamax movie. Almost. Well, they were they were I love they that. were brought I'll, out. I'll talk about it. We'll talk about, yeah, we, we we can talk about it now. Go ahead. So I guess uh what was the company? IT? So the movie ITC was the ITC. movie that was producing it, yeah. So they normally do, I guess, Skinamax movies, right? Well, that's, that's how they pitched it. That's, that's how, how they, they pitched, pitched it to uh ITC. It was gonna be like a Skinamax for people that don't know, not softcore, but there's nudity, there's sex it's all the sexual stuff and, and it's, right. it's 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 meant to entice the younger male audience. Exactly. <laughs> this the stuff you see late night on, you know, you used so, to see late night on HBO and Cinemax. I don't know anything about that. I only oh, only of watch not. honest of course to good, not. honest to good, pure stuff for me. Sure. So I guess there was a scene, I guess there's a whole bunch of scenes where there's a role playing element to the, the film. And there's one film where Linda Fiorentino's character is in a cheerleading outfit and she's got suspenders over her nipples. Yeah. Yes. And the executive saw the dailies yelled at them and said what is this are you trying to make an art house film yeah. just because her nipples were blocked yeah and brought the cast and crew out to swear that they had no ulterior motives no art quote-unquote artistic pretensions <laughs> about the film i know can you no i'm sorry we're not artists i swear we're we're making trash i swear we're making trash which <laughs> which uh, and they weren't they were trying to make a real movie they were they, yeah they were just trying to get the money and it makes sense then that you saw it on HBO first, but I guarantee you they put it on HBO and everyone was like, uh, she's really good in this. And then they probably were like, oh, we can make some money off this. So, oh, absolutely. And they screwed themselves out of a best picture. Yeah, to the point best where they went to go not. sue. They wanted a skin yeah, yeah, to the point yeah. where now they're suing the Oscars yeah. for not nominating they, their actors. They screwed, they, they, ATC screwed themselves over, uh, or, or October Films or whoever, for doing that. But that's, a, yeah, but that's funny. That makes me laugh because they're like, <laughs> get over here. I swear to God, you tell me right now, you better be making trash. We don't make good movies here at ITC. <laughs> <laughs> swear to me, you're making garbage. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that made me laugh. I was like, ah, ah, ah. all right. Although, to that point, yes. Clay brings up role playing at the end. Well, they do it at the end. Are we doing role- another role play? Yeah, maybe? That's are you true. doing this? And yeah. if that was brought up a couple more times in the movie, the line would have made a little bit more true, sense. True. I felt like it was just thrown out there. But there, there, there's like there's four sex scenes, but not before not, that. There's not three. including the montage thing. There's one. There's one behind the bar, one in the car, one at the house, one to his house, a couple at, at their house. And there's a, so there's a couple. So the, they probably had a lot more, which is interesting. Yeah, because that would that's a lot. But anyways, so but I see what you're saying. It might have helped the movie. <laughs> well, it would I think. The role play aspect, the role play aspect, not just more sex scenes, with the but, ending, right? I mean, you knew what she was doing to try. And what's funny is because she finds out in the movie. So well, I guess we're jumping to the end. In the movie, she wants to know Mike's secret because Mike has a secret, which they they allude to, but they don't really, they don't really focus on too much. You just know he, did, you know what I mean? Like you know he did something weird, but they they bring it up once, or she goes, "Give it to a man," and he goes, "No." Yeah. All defensive. So but. he so Mike goes to Buffalo and I don't know. I apparently Buffalo is like the big time city compared to Beston. And he goes to Buffalo and he gets drunk one night, he meets a woman, they get married well real quick, and uh he finds out that she's actually she's really a man. She's transgender, right? She, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He finds that out. It it's obviously embarrassing to him because he, you know, he's not he's not into that. He leaves. He gets a, I guess, gets a quick divorce, or he says he gets divorced. He said he's planning on getting. Yeah, divorced. okay. He will be getting right. divorced. Right. So he comes back. 
So then she goes and she finds out who it is. And as soon as, and I forgot this, this part of the movie, I totally forgot this part. But when she's at the door and she's, oh yeah, come on. I'm like, oh, okay. Now I know. Like I immediately knew what it was, what was going on, the, the plot point. And uh, so, yeah. So then, so when she, she uses that so that when they go back to, she cons Mike into going to kill Clay. Right. Clay talks himself out of it. Mike figures it out. She shows up, then she kills him, and then she starts fighting with him and convinces him to like she and basically she starts wanting to have sex with him and she says, Rape me, take me now, rape me, rape me. And then he says, that's what you want. He gets all angry and yeah. she's dialing 911 as he's doing it. So she's role playing with him, but she's conning him into basically taking, you know, and he keeps I killed your husband, like, you know, yeah, I did. Role yeah, play. Yeah. Yeah. But what the whole thing about I'm bringing up that point is the fact that she's dressed with the suspenders, with the pants. She's yeah. dressed like a, a like a man almost, and it's mm-hmm. almost like it's almost like a big like flipping it off to Mike, right? Which and, is what sets him right, up, right? Right, right. So it's just that layer upon layer of manipulation that, in terms of Linda Fiorentino's character, that or Bridget, not not, not, not saying that. There's a level of respect on my end, but it's it's I appreciate that work into that character in that regard. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's still not a great movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, well, so your first point was you didn't you you, you paused so it at 30 minutes, 33 minutes. And we're not even part of we're not even in the story. It's just this one woman and this hopeless doofus weirdo hopeless doofus weirdo i just really want to get to know you i don't know why you just let's let's stop having sex let's just let's talk (laughs) get over it dude she doesn't like you she's a terrible person at every turn of the corner the relationship is so dumb i I get it i get it luda fiorentino is very attractive but she's crazy evil and he's already done her and she clearly wants nothing to do with him so I keep having to watch this for like an hour straight before we get to the, all right, now let's figure out how to kill people. All right. I don't really want to kill people. It's fake killing people. Cause I just want you to kill this one guy. And it's like, I have to sit there for an hour and 30 something minutes before we get to the plot of the movie. Does not a good movie make. And it's just like, I get she's evil and she's really good at it, but the whole movie rides so much on her okay. that I can't sit here and tell you that I really enjoyed the movie. I, super enjoyed her character and i very much enjoyed the way it ended and wrapped up right but it's just a lot of nonsense in the middle that i really i just cannot tell you that that makes it interesting to watch you, it was not you don't find believability in mike being somebody who can't quote unquote quit her can't no. walk away from her because he's too smart for that but he's also too dumb is he too smart for that he's yes he is a million characters in one and it just does not make sense and her entire plan kind of hinges it almost seems like she's always had this plan but it also seems like her entire plan hinges on this one guy who she didn't want to deal with and then all of a sudden wrapped into it i didn't get the sense that she had this big plan because she talks to her lawyer and the lawyer says stay put because she so she has no idea what to do with the money right which which I like that line when he's like when he she's her lawyer's JT Walsh that's the guy that he's playing the lawyer and he knows both of them so in in she's like I'm out of here he's like oh really he doesn't care he's her lawyer yeah and he's like can he afford a good lawyer she's like not anymore and he's like oh I totally forgot who I was talking to like something like that yeah he knows she's evil right yeah yeah so I th- and and I guess that character was gonna coin to come back at the end of the movie as Mike's lawyer right but uh, that uh, I guess they didn't that was too much of a coincidence kind of thing. If that happened, I wouldn't see. I wouldn't have thought it was a coincidence so much as somehow she got JT Walsh mm-hmm. to be Mike's lawyer to make sure he couldn't get out. Right. Uh, see, I don't view I don't view Mike as a big doofus like you do. I I I, I view you that from he, doofus to Dorcas. He's just the worst. Well, I, I think he's a character who's damaged, who clearly has some kind of emotional uh, issues with what has happened to him in Buffalo. I can't fathom going to the big city, Buffalo. I can't fathom that, but all right, whatever. And and I think that bothered him because he's back to where he was. He's back in Beston. So he's back. He thought he left and he thought he was someplace that he was moving on from his town. And now he's forced to come back to all his old friends and people he doesn't like. And, you know, we right. just, quote unquote, these women are anchors, as he says. So I I understand that he's not the the most well put together person right now. Mm hmm. 
I, and he does have the uh, your doofus quality is is a, is a note is I understand that, but I think he she makes him be that way. She makes him weak because he's so entranced by her New York City ways, and she's not best in. Do you know what I mean? Beston is not a the podunk one horse but town that's what they, that they they keep building they it up say to be. It is. But you look at a town and it's not, and their insurance building is absolutely not. They're they're yeah. it does it what they say Beston is and what they're showing on screen are not the same thing. Sure. So when to have him be that hapless and hopeless, and to really believe that that's a New York City person and not that's a crazy conniving bitch, <laughs> and like leave her after a while, it's like I I I get. Want to have a couple hookups? I, I get that. Sure, but when she keeps pushing away with an actual thing, and when she keeps mentioning fucking murder, <laughs> just leave. You it doesn't when, make sense when she's having them call. When uh, she's having insurance. them call the insurance yeah. thing. So explain that a little bit. So she's she gets the plan all of a sudden because Mike, as a claims adjuster, uh, yes, he says he's pretty, he knows people. So he learns yeah. to know people personally because they have to talk about their issues to him. So he mentions one lady whose husband was killed in a car accident. And she found out that she was entitled to $50,000 um, in damages for that. And she told him that had she known that, she would have gotten rid of him a long time ago because he was cheating and conniving behind their back. And Bridget says, how do you know that? And he says, oh, well, you know, as their claims adjuster, I, I can see the credit reports and see that he had multiple credit credit cards in other women's names. High interest, uh, high yeah, credit yeah. limit ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she was like, oh. So she's like, well, let's cross reference the list of the people who have life insurance, but also have these credit cards with other women and figure out who's cheating on who and then call these women and mention, you know, murder to them. Call the wives. Yeah. Basically yeah. selling murder. And at first it seems like a game to Mike. And then she starts asking him like, well, let's actually do it. Let's actually make good on our promise. And he's like, are you kidding? You're not kidding. Oh my God. You want to do murder? It's constant. Like we get four scenes of that and it's Mike, just leave. Murder is murder. You're gonna get caught. Yeah, like you're not a you're not a hitman, man. It's a it's a big jump. I agree. And uh, like, just, he has so many chances to leave and so many opportunities where it doesn't make sense for him to stay. And a character who we see at the beginning, who's talking about anchors, who who is talking as, as like we've said before, it seems like he's smart, and now all of a sudden he's so dumb, and he gets dumber as the movie goes along to the point where at the end he doesn't even remember the plan right. Right. He doesn't even do the murder plan correctly. Yeah. No, I, 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 I you make good points. I'm and not, so I'm, is this yeah. a noir or is this a dark comedy? Because the end is definitely a comedy. Bill Pullman's in a comedy, <laughs> plays in a comedy. And I like Bill Pullman in this movie quite a bit um, because he is so sleazy and, and very. Yeah. Uh, just terrible. Like, I, I really like Bill Pullman in this. I see. I, I couldn't. I couldn't take him not be not at anything and not at his fault of his any, any of his fault. Seriously. I can't take him seriously back because I I just I don't think he's that type of I've never I've seen him in other roles where he's the good guy and he just always has that good guy charm. I mean he does that that's what I like is he's he's a bad guy with a little bit of charm. Like he's always trying to hug the people. Oh, thanks, man. It's yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. So stop. I know. I, when he when he's like <laughs> oh when he's when he when he says something to Bill Nunn. Uh, Harlan, Bill Nunn's plays Harlan. And he says, give it to me or slap me five or something like that. And he's like, no. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was something that made me laugh. Uh, so while I like his character and he brings a bit of levity to film, it's like he's in a different film. And then, uh, but they're both very good. Linda Fiorentino and Bill Pullman. And if it was more, I think about their cat and mouse game than it is. Mm -hmm. And take out the Mike element more or just make the Mike element way less. Maybe if you pulled back Mike. And made it more about their battle between each other. Maybe. Once Clay finds her. Have Clay find her maybe a little earlier. That's a more interesting movie. And have Mike in there, but he's the secondary character. Throw him away. Sure. He's this lovey-dovey obsessed, you know, as he calls himself. And he is. He's a fuckboy. Designated, that's, that's, designated yeah. fuck. Yeah, that's it. That's him. it. That's all he is. Yeah. So just leave him at that and then make it the battle between Clay and Bridget. You can still have Mike come and do his things, but it would make for a more interesting movie. And I would believe it more if I didn't know more about Mike. Okay. Or constantly see these opportunities for Mike to get out. So you 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 didn't like that at, at 30 minutes, you still had not no, had no idea what was going on. Or the genre of movie I was watching. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> you don't like Doofus Dorcas Mike. Oh my god. And I I really like Peter Berg in most movies. Um, I think he's great in, and he plays another doofus Dorcas in uh, The Great White Hype. I don't know if you've ever seen I've that. I've seen that, yeah, yeah. I think he's great in that as the doofus Dorcas. So he plays it well, but in this movie, I just, 
I really didn't like him. And maybe it was him in the role. Okay. I, I just really didn't like that character. So what else? What else kind of does that? Those are the only two big, your big negatives. I mean, those are, those are some okay. Big negatives. That's fine. Um, I, just, I was just yeah. trying to get through them. I, f- I feel like the movie's just a little too long because you don't, it's just so many scenes of, I don't, I don't think I can do it. No, do it. I don't think I do it. It's just, I only need maybe one of those and then they'll get to the rest of the plan. Well, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing about this movie. And, and you're, you make good points and I'm not going to argue those points and that's fine. This movie is, I enjoy this movie and this movie's popular or it's because it's whatever they do on Rotten Tomatoes. What is it like? 94%. This movie is this good. Movie is well this movie reviewed, is yes. well reviewed because of Linda Fiorentino. Absolutely. Because of her. So this is almost her the best role that she will ever play ever again, maybe ever. I mean, it's, it's a perfect role for her. She plays it well, mm-hmm. uh, very well. Um, so, it, but if, so my, my, what I'm trying to get to is if somebody else is playing this character, then those problems might be more prevalent to a lot of people. Oh, absolutely. You know what I, mean? I can yeah. absolutely see why you put this on the list and I'm glad I watched it because she is so good in this. Film. Yes. She carries this film. Absolutely. I'm just saying there's a better film that could be made with her. Sure. her character but i think the fact that her character is so well done and she plays it so well it does elevate this film i would also if i was to review it i would give it a fairly good grade as well yeah because of how good she is sure and how interesting her character not just how good she is but her writing and how interesting the character is right because even today you don't see this a lot or that kind of character a femme fatale or just somebody uh, who's so manipulative a femme fatale main character is still not done very often true and yeah, someone who's so manipulative and gets away with it never gets caught as the main character. Um. Well, they're the, usually they're uh, caught or they change their ways. Like yeah, people, they're the people you shouldn't like, like Walter White in Breaking Bad, although he doesn't get away with it. But like you know, Don Draper and Mad Men, like that kind of those people that they're not great people. They're they're flawed. I shouldn't say they're not great. They're flawed, right. even though Walter White's a criminal, but they're flawed. And you really shouldn't root for them, but you do because they've endeared themselves to you. She is she is not endeared. She does no, not. That's, yeah. She doesn't care. She doesn't have those moments. She doesn't have the the family she's trying to support like Walter White did at least right. at first. <laughs> uh, she doesn't have a quest that she's trying to go on. She's not protecting anyone. She's not at the end going, all right, now the 700 million is going to this children's charity or at the very end going, Mike, I've gotten you out of prison. Just mm-hmm. don't come find me again. Mm-hmm. Thanks for the help. There's none of that. She's a destroyer of everything in her path. She is, she is like the devil incarnate. <laughs> and it's, it's very, very interesting to not have an antihero as your villain. You just have a villain as your villain. Right. So I was, as you were talking, I was looking up Fen Fatales and I was, and then I got to like, you know, 25 top Fen Fatales of all time, whatever, whatever <laughs> is on EW. And then like, they've got like, you know, basic instinct, like Catherine Tremell, Sharon Stone's character, uh, Nicole Kidman to die for, um, you know, like, but the, those are like, they're bad guys. You know what I mean? Like they're villains. Like she's not, a, she's a femme fatale, but she's not the lead. Like Linda Fiorentina in terms of. Sharon's. Oh no, they never are. Right. Yeah. You know, it, and like, they all have their moments of, of comeuppance or a change of heart. Yeah. Yeah. I, Jane Smith from Mr. Mrs. Smith. That's not what? All right. Enough of that nonsense. That's not a femme fatale. No, that's, that's not a femme fatale. All right. That now that's an action here. <laughs> <Entertainment Weekly. laughs> I've like, now left your website. That was ridiculous. All right. Did you like the the writing, the mirror style writing, the writing backwards for the mirror? Do you, did you like that? All right. The only reason it's there primarily mm-hmm. is so that Bill Pullman can figure out her, where she's hi- her, her nom de plume or where she's hiding. Right. And which is a name. little bit of a leap when he because because when she takes Wendy Croy. K-R-O-Y and it's supposed to be New York backwards because right. that's how she writes. But it's a bit of a jump when he figures that out looking in the mirror he leaves only one note for her and then you get a little bit of it when she writes her signature backwards in the beat when she writes the note for him yep and also i hated that moment where she writes her signature backwards when she's signing up for the job right she's so manipulative she she's so particular about everything she does right and then conveniently for script's sake, we got to remind people that she can write backwards. <laughs> that she forgets to sign her own freaking contract. It's just like when I watched it, I was like, oh. so writing backwards is going to be a thing again. Okay, I get it. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was okay with it. No okay. Other than that one moment where it was a little too hammered home, I, I was okay with it. Maybe if she left more notes for him. Mm-hmm. 
mean that we're backwards, that would be more interesting. Like, let's say there's a there's a what you're supposed to do with the money or, or a checklist for the plan that she gave him, like she gives Mike later. Yeah, okay. And Bill Pullman pulls it out and it's written backwards. So then he puts it against his car window, like his side view mirror, and he has a car. Yeah. He goes, oh, okay, that's the plan. Yeah. And so we see it twice. I just don't think we see it enough. Maybe that's why it bothers you more. All right. What if, because do you think if you saw it more, it would be a little bit less of a stretch? I, I only, I only think it's a leap to get from New York to Wendy. You, you know what I mean? Like, mm. I just think that's a, that's a bit of a leap. It's a uh, movie. For me. It's a movie. No, device, I, yeah. I, it is. It is. That, that I, I like. I Only like, in movies. <laughs> I like using the writing in the mirror angle to get to that point. I just think of it's a it's a bit of a jump that he gets there so fast. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is where she is. Look for Wendy Croy. Like I'm really. What if he was? What if he figured out? Oh, her name may, might be backwards, and starts looking for what it could be, or look for last names Croy, like something like that. Right. Or like some. I don't know. I, it, that was just that was just my thing. Uh, one of the things I wasn't a fan of was the score. It was a very coffee house rom com New York style score, mm-hmm, absolutely, and, and it really, and it was consistent and it was repeated over and over and over, and it was just enough already. Uh, I'm not watching. I mean, this is perfect for if I'm watching a movie where it's 90 minutes of people, uh, two people in a relationship having a relationship throughout the day in New York, and you see them as they, you know, that's what that score is for, right? Not this, not this movie. Well, that probably helped me put me in me my. Uh... What movie is this? <laughs> yeah, I wasn't a fan of the score. Not or the fact that Bert ate that whole plate of cookies. <laughs> oh yeah. I was like, what, dude? <laughs> I was expecting him to be passed out in the car and then wake up and run over the, the tire thing. And then he's just like sitting there still waiting for her. Yeah, yeah. shucks. Well, what are you gonna do? You can't yeah, I know. follow her. <laughs> Eating all those cookies. <laughs> How does he not immediately think like, oh, she probably poisoned those cookies? Like Clay probably warned him, don't trust. He him. didn't care. He sniffed them. Yeah. Yeah, sniffed them. Well, speaking of smell speak, like cookies. Speaking of sniffing. Oh no! Don't bring it up. I'm gonna I, bring I have it a up. note, but because I don't understand why up. you do this. <sighs> Go ahead. So when Mike, <laughs> when Mike hits on her at the bar when he first sees Bridget, he says, "You know, I'm hungry like a horse." Just saying again. And uh, anyways, I'm just saying. And she's like, "All right, let's see, let's see." So she. He sits down and he's just like, what are you doing right here? We're here. What are you doing? And she reaches in and she touches him to feel him, whatever, whatever. She's that's the type of person she is. That's the type of character she is. But she pulls her fingers up and she sniffs it. And I'm just like, why? What is that part of the test? I mean, maybe she wants to make sure that, you know, it's not going to be stinky when they do it in two seconds. I, I, I don't maybe know. Maybe they're going to have sex that fast. You know, not I, even take a shower. I don't know. I didn't know that. Like, I almost just what if she I wonder if she did that in the scene. They're like, oh, that's great. Keep doing that. Or like that was a note from the director. Like, oh, you know what you should do? You know what you should do? Listen, listen, Linda. Listen. You reach down there. But then when you come up, you smell it. Why? Just because. Because. And roll camera. You want to make. <laughs> All right. Two, two other possibilities. Ooh. ITC or whatever went. She's got to sniff it. <laughs> our, our people, our viewers really like. We've done focus groups. The crotch. We've done focus groups it. for Cinemax films. And this is what happens. Or. The fact that she sniffs it is almost like checking, like not, she doesn't want him to to breed her, obviously, but like breeding stock, like <laughs> like he's an animal, he's less than human to her because they oh, all okay. are. So it's, it's like that is really even more demoralizing and dehumanizing to do that. Maybe I could. So see to that. do that, it's almost like she's selecting a new pet for herself. Mm-hmm. I can see. It's that. still really gross, and it's a note I have that when, I was just like, "What?" <laughs> so when you go to get a dog. You're sniffing your fingers after you're touching right them. Right in there, going, this good dog stock. Why are you? Why are you mm. from Texas now? Because uh, I got to choose my stock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, that was very, very gross. Yeah, <laughs> I like how they use uh, small town, uh, small town racism as a as a plot point here. Again, oh, that was so dumb. W- which part? The the black man part. At right when when because Bill Nunn is looking goes basically shows up at her place of business and he asks for her and she's not there so when she walks in the secretary goes she's like there was a black man here to see you I don't know but and she's like what do you want I don't know but he was black and then she walks up the stairs and others did you tell him about the black guy I was like yeah. Jesus Christ. not the black guy the I, black man I get oh, right. it's like I, as if it was I, one word I get that but I, and I I know I and you know what I believe that. But but the, the, they they do that there I think because when she's in the hospital and the she uses it she uses well she knows it already she right. knows that that's how the, and the officer is trying to talk to her she basically 
plays on that and he's just like oh yeah okay yeah yeah exactly exactly so that's probably there for that but that's 100 percent believable that that's happening i don't i i not uh, that not the i don't think the racism would happen yeah but that it was that blatant in terms of there was a black man like there's no black people that town again is in? not the podunk town that they think and it's right outside of buffalo i don't and know it's like you're gonna act like I, I know buffalo is not as big as new york city but buffalo is still a big city i believe it i i like i've never seen a black there's a, i i believe it maybe maybe not that overt maybe she goes maybe he was black. yeah maybe not, the, not there was maybe a black not man. that it's, there, yeah it's probably not that overt as you're saying but it was it that's definitely there they're saying it's so overt it's like they don't care it's 1950s Mayberry. We're watching a night like, and there's one like black it's Pleasantville. Guy yeah, and there's one black guy walking through the town. It's like yeah, that's a little bit different. Though. Not, I be, don't not be believe the racism and her. He's like, Motherfuck. I don't believe like the hospital scene. Just that overtness part in there. You think it's like, a little too much? It's too much. And too much in the terms of that they wouldn't be so open about it. They would be a little bit more hush hush kind of. They'd thing. be more hushed hushed and. It's not only the the racism, but the shock of a black person in their town at all. Oh, like they would have that shock. That right? they would okay. have that yeah, shock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I what I you. I got you. Okay. Shock. Right. I got you. That's fine. Uh, I understand that. Which if they pick the small, just film we're in a not, smaller town or have that insurance building, that. not a skyscraper, half a skyscraper. What, their insurance building? Their insurance building's huge, which shows again that that town has got to be. Well, you're assuming a, that, a that large insurance town. building is in Beston. You're assuming that. That might not be in Beston. It might be in a different town. But they want it to be. Well, think of it this way too, like the town from Red Rock West, which is not. Well, no, 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 it's definitely not that. But think of this: you got to think that everybody in Beston, probably seventy-five percent of the workforce, is at Interstate. Is it? You know I what if, I mean? If you're going to say it's that small, they'd have to. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. So if they leave, that town goes on. It's an insurance town. <laughs> Again, I don't know why I'm doing the Southern accent. When I New York. don't understand either. <laughs> Because movies have conditioned me to believe that small towns only exist in the south. I don't know. I like, uh, you're in a small town right now. This is a small town. Uh, not as small as Beston. No, from not, what at said, not at all. Not at all. Not as backward thinking as well. well I, I'd like to think so. I'd like to hope so. Uh, where you, right where we are right now with you? I don't know. Well, I can see that, that happening that, here. Well, that don't represent me. Don't represent me. Not where I am, but where you are. <laughs> um, all right. So why do you think? Why do you think this is? A forgotten movie. How about that? This is probably a good one. Because the movie... Because I don't like it. <laughs> ...is not as strong as its main character. Okay. Because the movie was released on HBO first, then came out in theaters and made absolutely no money. If it, would got, if it had the Oscar nom, I think that would have helped almost advertise for it, right. and people would continue to keep watching it. But I think the way that it was released and kind of ignored and kind of shunned... Yeah. And the production companies themselves probably don't exist anymore. I never. Um, I don't think about. ITC is around as much, but October Films is. Oh, that's right. Okay, but they're not huge companies, so it's it's not they're, something they're, they're doing. This is an indie, two point five million exactly. production budget. Yeah. That's probably why. Okay, what's the percentage of people that watch this movie because Linda Fiorentino's nude in it? Originally, uh, I would say. It would be ninety percent guys yeah. watching it because yeah. Linda Fiorentino is nude in it, yeah. and then ten percent women being dragged to the movie because Linda Fiorentino is nude. Uh, in it. I don't think. Yeah, <laughs> just I. I think that's. Oh, a, honey, we gotta watch. Did this you movie. see this movie? Oh my god! It's called the Last Seduction. Oh, great! Let's go watch it. <laughs> why? Uh, <laughs> oh, I know why you wanted to watch it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, why do you? Well, I mean, why do you think? What's the title mean? I've always I've wondered this. Like, what's the last seduction? Is this the her last seduction? I think that's what they're kind of going for. It's that this is the last time she'll ever do this. The last time she'll need to do it. But that's the other thing. Seven hundred thousand doesn't get you very far, and she's acting at the end like she has five million dollars. Uh, yeah. Well, it's also early nineties, but yes, I agree. Living in New York City is still costly. Well, I don't. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. maybe she did some investments. Maybe. I don't know. Oh, uh, well, she's smart like that. Yeah, maybe. But what's the last seduction? It's like, last, what is? It's also Mike's last seduction. He tried to seduce Bridget, and that's true. That didn't that's work true. well. I could reference that. But also her last seduction of you know, the last Black Widow moment she'd need. Like you said, you don't know what she's done before. Although I think that might be her first full time. Who I don't knows? know. Who knows? J T. Walsh seems to know her really well. Yeah. Who yeah. knows what her other screw? She's definitely screwed other people over in the past, but mm -hmm. who knows how big? Yeah. But I like I like the idea that you kind of seeded in my mind of of doing the first seduction. 
and seeing how she became this way. Mm. Or even a last seduction two that's got a real last seduction two with last seduction three. No, she yeah. won't do it again. She's in. She hasn't the done final anything. seduction. She hasn't done anything since two thousand nine. Wow. She was involved with the Anthony Pelicano case. Okay. For those who don't know, you can look it up. He basically was wiretapping people, celebrities, and stuff like that. And you know, it was a big Hollywood thing. And John McTiernan was wrapped up in that. And, and she was getting. So there was a FBI agent who she was talking to, and she was getting inform. He got he got arraigned and arrested for. Um, because he was giving her files and stuff on the case and she was giving it to the lawyers to help because she was saying that she was doing a movie or something like that. Like she was, mm-hmm. she's involved in all this. So she, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but she, she hasn't done anything for at least 11 years. Eh, whatever. Done with Hollywood. Well, or Hollywood's done with her. Eh, whatever. Yeah. Uh, just all things right. happen. Life goes on, I guess. Well, then the first deduction. <laughs> don't let that for <laughs> recast. Recast. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't. I I don't really. Or you can keep putting her in movies. You I can just, just make I it just, like a like a detective series. But your detective is this evil femme fatale, uh, kind of the anti. Well, just film noir. Well, the fact that some of these femme fatales on that list are not even femme fatales, and they're just they're struggling exactly. to find it. You know, you make a ton of movies where it's like Dick Tracy, and it's like he's making it. He's on a new case all yeah. the time, or Perry Mason, or whatever it is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So just put her in a movie. Here's the score or the talented Mr. Ripley. There's two of those, right? That's just two times he's trying to. Oh, uh, well, not, not the connected. same character. They, he's the same character, but it's not the same actor. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Well, Ripley so do the same thing the with the first her. one, a uh, prequel. The second one, a prequel. I mean, second one is technically a prequel, I believe. Yeah. Yes. I'd have to watch it. I haven't watched them in forever. But you could do something with that, where she's just always trying to do a score. Yeah. Yeah. Eh. Would you recommend this movie? Yeah, because she's really, really good, and yeah. it's really interesting. I'm. I'm I can sit here and tell you it's not a good movie, but her character is so good that it makes it a good movie. See, I don't think it's not a good movie. It's not a. Yeah, I could say it's not. I'm saying it's not. It's not a bad movie. <laughs> right. right okay. It's not a good. Movie. OK. <laughs> but you can well, say it's a good movie. That's fine. I think it's a good movie. Yeah, I, I, I can. I understand your points and I, you. I, I'm not really or I'm not. I, I get it. And I, I understand what you're saying. Um, And there are some of them are, I agree with. Uh, some of them are just like, eh, maybe, maybe not. You know, but she's the she based if she wasn't in this movie and it was somebody else and it was a it was somebody who didn't know the character as well as she did, that might be a problem. Yep. That that the so those issues that you're having, I might be more like, Oh yeah, oh yeah. But because she's really good in this, um, I guess I'm willing to let those slide, I guess I'm, I'm, i I assume. I don't know. I'm terrible of me. How terrible of me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome. So check it out if you can. Last Seduction. Right now it is on HBO and HBO Max. HBO Go. HBO Go. HBO. HBO Does something. HBO Now still exist? By the time people are listening to this, it's going to just be HBO Go and HBO Max. Well, you know, at some point, HBO, why don't you make that deal at Roku so I can not have to keep being told by Butler, it's on the PlayStation Network. <laughs> I mean, it's on PlayStation. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, and uh, yeah, so what do we do now? But we say that if you like our podcast, check us out at ForgottenCinemaPodcast.com. <laughs> you can see all our older and newer episodes on there, including links to our merch store page and little blog posts that we do about everything. Also, feel free to check out our other podcasts that we have on the Forgotten Entertainment page. We have tons of other content for you as well that you can listen to and enjoy. Something called Cracking One Open. Crack One Open. Two Player Bros. Yet another Marvel podcast. And uh, yet another MCU podcast. Yet another MCU Butler. podcast. If you're going so to promote it, you need to understand the name of it. Yo, fuck it. Don't, don't listen to that podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and the Nomcast. So if you want to listen to those podcasts, go right ahead and check them out. All uh, ForgottenEntertainment.com as well. And check out our commercials that we do every week. We're also on social media at Forgotten Cinema Pod. Let us know what movies you want to do. We'll add them to our list. You know, we love talking about movies. Let us know what you thought of The Last Seduction. Obviously, me and uh, field have differing opinions we'd love to hear yours yes so next week we'll be doing a movie that is also on hbo weather yes <laughs> it's the 2011 sci-fi thriller the adjustment bureau starring matt damon and emily blunt uh well i'm gonna tell you right now we both like this movie so uh but but yeah. it, we never hear about it anymore no one ever talks about it no, no we're, we're going to i think i know why but we'll talk about Ooh, it. <laughs> is it the hats 
It's the is head. it the fedoras? No, because those are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I sense that there's going to be a fedora I, commercial. I, I want to get back to the time where we can all just wear. <laughs> wear you can you can wear a fedora right now if you want. Go for it. Only the, that's a, that, that's that, your. Thing. I was just going off on dorks and dorkuses, and now you want me to wear a fedora? Come on, man. <laughs> you said doofuses and dorkuses. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's next week. The Adjustment Bureau. Thanks for listening, guys and, and girls and ladies and men. And that's terrible. Let me do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, don't use that. <laughs> I swear to God. Yeah, the more you keep talking about me not using it, the more I'm going to want to use it. Fuck yourself, Bubba. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Try, join us next. Uh, oh, Christ. Oh, I, can't even that. I mean, this part I'd cut out. This part's garbage. All right, that's it. We'll see you next week. My name is Mike Field. I'm Mike Butler. And this has been Forgotten Cinema. Twas. Tis. Sniff that dick. <laughs> oh, yeah, so we, can, we can do it. We can do it. I approve.